All right, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you this morning. It's wonderful to be able to come and worship the Lord together. And um, as we get started, just a couple announcements. Uh, don't forget the women, the free women's clothing event, Friday and Saturday. So it's Friday evening and Saturday morning here at the church. So invite your friends, come, and, and uh, we used to call it an exchange. It's not so much an exchange. Just come and get free women's, clo women's and juniors clothes. And also, you might have seen the, the baby bottles out in the foyer. Um, if you didn't take one last week or the week before, those are just for Options 360, which is a great ministry in Vancouver that helps um, pregnant moms um, and their babies. And, and so a great and worthy ministry. So take a bottle, fill it up with change, bring it back uh, on Father's Day, and we'll, we'll turn those into Options 360 and bless them in that way. Um, would you stand with us as we uh, enter into worshiping the Lord? hear me when 
and I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in Your name, for You alone can save. You will deliver me. Yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. It's always by my side, the one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine, the God of angel armies. It's always by my side, the God of angel armies. It's always by my side. Would you join me in prayer? Father, uh, just thank you that you are always by our side. You are always with us. You've promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And so just give us boldness and courage each day to follow you in faith. I thank you that you use ordinary people, and that you'll use anyone who would follow you and believe in you. Lord, I thank you just for this collection of brothers and sisters in Christ here. Um, we're just family in you, Jesus, that we're a bunch of ordinary people um, coming from different walks of life and just coming together to worship you and to follow you together. And I thank you that you use people like us, that your disciples, they weren't special. They were fishermen and tax collectors and regular people, Lord, and, and you filled them with your spirit and you used them as you, we think of Pentecost and the outpouring of your spirit. Thank you, the Holy Spirit, that you are still at work in us today. We pray for your blessing on this church. We pray for your blessing on our worship service this morning, that you would be working in hearts and glorifying Jesus. And help us to fix our eyes on you and just do your work this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In 
the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. that you rose all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead was from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the King of Kings. All right, just I'll sit right here so you guys just find a seat on the stage and I'm going to do a kid's message this morning. So don't be shy. If you're still out there, you can come on up here and sit with all the other kids. How are you guys this morning? Good. Good. That's fine. You can come on up. That's, that's a great age. Four is good. I'm 44, so that's a little older than four. Yeah? Did you want to say something? <laughs> uh, I wish you guys could see that from my angle. That's awesome. You want to say hello? Hello. <laughs> All right. Come on down, you guys. All right. Good to see you this morning. So, you know what? 
Do you guys know that church is for you guys too? It's not just something for adults, but it's for kids too. So all of us, whatever our ages, we can come and worship Jesus together. And so that's why we're having you guys have a message time in here today. And the jam kids are going to stand with, with their parents today. And just, um, you know, you're not too young to be a part of church. I have a picture here. You guys see it? Sorry, you guys out there probably can't see that very well. But you see it? Can you raise your hand? Anyone have a guess what that picture might be about? Do you know? What do you, th- what do you think that is? Uh, Jesus. Jesus, yes, you're right. <laughs> right answer. Do you, do you have a guess what that might be of? Jesus unblinding a person. That's a really good guess. He did that a few times. Um, Let's go one more. Do you have a guess? Yeah, all the people gathering around Jesus to learn about Jesus. Yep, that's right. You know, specifically, this is his 12 disciples. So the disciples were the people that followed Jesus closely as he worked and he did miracles like helping blind people see, and other things. And he had 12 disciples that he called to follow him. Yeah, what? He turned water into wine. That was his first miracle. He did it at a wedding, which is awesome. He did a lot of amazing things. Can any of you name one of his 12 disciples? You think, do you have a guess, or do you know? Uh, Matthew. Matthew. Matthew is one, that's right. Yeah. Matthew is your dad. They had the same name. Peter, Zinnia, you said Peter, that's right. Do you know one? Joseph. Joseph. I guess I should know the, the names of the 12 disciples so that I can double check your answers. But Joseph is in the Bible, you're right. And actually, you know what? Joseph was Jesus' father. Boaz, do you know? Luke was not, but he did write one of the Gospels in the Bible. Yes. Do you? John. Yeah. John was one of the 12 disciples. Yeah. Do you? James. You're right. Your dad's name's James too, isn't it? Yep. You have a cousin named James. It's a good name. Um, So, okay, you guys, you one more? Last one. Mark. Mark. Mm. Was Mark a disciple? All of a sudden, no. But he wrote one of the Gospels, so you're right. He, was, he knew Jesus, and he wrote one of, the, one of the Gospels. So, you guys, there's 12 disciples. And I have an activity sheet I'm going to put in the back for after this that has their names all jumbled up, and you can mix and match it and color it in. But uh, hold your question for, for just a sec. But do you think his disciples were really special people that he called to follow him? No? You don't think, you think yes? You think no? Do you think they were, what kind of people do you think that Jesus would call to follow him? Normal people like us. Like shepherds? That, I don't know if he had any shepherds there, but that is the kind of person he would call. He's the good shepherd and we're his sheep, you're right. Do you know that he called a bunch of fishermen to be his disciples? Yeah, Peter was one of them. Peter was a fisherman. James and John were fishermen, and there's probably a couple others that were fishermen. He called a tax collector. That sounds like a good job. What do you think? Do you, it's a bad job. Do you, know what's, do you know what's funny about a tax collector? Like, nobody really likes to pay taxes. You can ask your parents about that later. Nobody really likes it, but the Jews really didn't like tax collectors because they thought it was wrong to pay taxes to Rome, that they should only pay it to God. And so when the Jews, like Matthew, became tax collectors, they were considered traitors and they hated them. They made fun of them and called them bad names. There was also a guy named Simon the Zealot, which means that he was a part of a a religious group that was violent and did violent things to try to take their nation back from from Rome. And so 
strange group of guys that Jesus called to follow him. And I think, you guys, one thing we can learn from this is that Jesus uses ordinary people. Like, he doesn't need rich or powerful or special or beautiful or anything. He just uses ordinary people. And so I think that means you guys, too. I think it does. You know what? There's a verse in the Bible in 1 Timothy 4 that says, don't let anyone think less of you because you're young. Be an example to all the believers in all that you say, in the way you live, in your life, in your love, in your faith, in your purity. So don't let people think less of you just because you're young, but follow Jesus and set an example. All right? So you guys can be Jesus' disciples too. Yeah. Um, I, I, th- I think, I think um, G- Jesus just always follow him for, for a couple of times. Well, yeah. Yeah, we, we follow Jesus. That's right. Do you know he called those fishermen? And he says, you know what? You're not going to catch fish anymore. I'm going to make you fishers of men, which means they would go and they'd tell other people about Jesus so that other people could know Jesus too. And you guys can do that too with your friends, your neighbors, the kids at school, and other kids you know. You can tell them how awesome Jesus is. All right. Mr. Andy is going to talk to us about some Christians in church history later. And so raise your hand if you guys are in jam, if you're old enough to be in jam. So maybe most of you or half of you, you're going to be in here. And so I want you to listen for these guys' names while Mr. Andy is preaching to us. And so here's one of them. Here's one of them. This guy's name was St. Augustine. Andy, do you say Augustine or Augustine? Augustine. So you might hear uh, St. Augustine talked about in the message today. He lived a long time ago, just a few hundred years after Jesus in North Africa. Your church history might be better than mine, but do you, are you maybe thinking of St. Patrick? No? St. Augustine? Okay. All right. Well, Andy will, Andy will tell us later. <laughs> Who do you think this guy? He's, he came a little bit longer after Jesus, like 1,500 years after Jesus. You have a guess? Oh, good job. You nailed it, buddy. Good job. It is Martin Luther. Um, so he was, he was a Christian in Germany, and he was a key figure in something we call the Reformation. So listen, when Mr. Andy's talking to him, talk about Martin Luther, and think about this guy's picture there. This guy looks kind of young and handsome, don't you think? He, can, <laughs> he has a ponytail, which is cool. But... He's not a Power Ranger, but he was a missionary to he was a missionary to the Native Americans in New England in the 1700s, and his name was David Brainerd. In a sense, he was a superhero because you'll hear about it later from Mr. Andy, but it's because of Jesus in him and working through him, and so he shared the gospel with Native Americans in New England. So listen for the name David Brainerd and anything you can remember about him from that message. It's a good name. It's a good name. Can I get one volunteer to pre- out of you guys who wants to pray? Oh, we're finished. Your hand shot up quick. You want to come up here and pray? You feel good? Can you, you know? Are you sure? Okay. All right. You come on. You just say a quick prayer and then we'll go sit down. What's your name? Nolan. Nolan Peters. Uh, uh, Lord, Lord, uh, thank you for um, for showing us mercy, even though we were mean to you. Thank you for uh, blessing us every day and guide us through night and and day. Amen. Good job. Good job. All right. Thanks for listening, you guys. Go sit down with your parents. Um, yep.
so there is there are classes for the preschool and down kids, but jam kids, you'll be in here. All right, Mr. Andy, you're on. ...of taking the pulpit for the next, for today and for next Sunday, and I really consider that a privilege. I'm going to ask for your patience. I'm basically working with my right eye. I had some surgery uh, six and a half weeks ago, and until I can get the proper contact on my left eye, that side's kind of a blur. And if, James, if you could turn those main lights down, uh, they are still awfully, awfully bright. I will do my best. In the past two to three months, Christians around the world have celebrated significant events. The first was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ which took place almost 2,000 years ago. He clearly stated that he laid down his life as the one who could, no one could take it from him. His death was the once for all sacrifice required by God, his Father, to take away the sins of the world. Only his sinless life could atone for the sins of all humans. All the daily sacrifices found in the Jewish rituals only covered sin for a time as they were simply animal sacrifices. They pictured the once for all process, the once for all priceless sacrifice for us spoken of in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter seven and 26, 26 and 27, we read, for such a high priest was fitting for, for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the people. For this he has done once for all when he offered up himself. Such a contrast between the Old Testament and what happened when Jesus died on the cross. Can't imagine how much blood was shed on all those altars in the Jewish economy, but it only covered sin. Jesus said once for all, he laid down his life. He made one sacrifice. His gift to us is eternal life in heaven. And it only comes by recognizing our sinfulness. Was it affecting the sound or just my appearance? <laughs> the sound is what's important. You get what you get when you look at me. <laughs> and it's the same way with you folks. Just don't laugh too hard. <laughs> anyway, I'll do the best I can. So his gift of eternal life in heaven only comes, only comes by recognizing first our sinfulness and second the need for salvation from sin and death. It requires faith as stated by the writer again in Hebrews. In chapter 11 verse five we read, but without faith it's impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This is the only way. There's no other option. It's by faith. The gift cost Jesus his very life, but it's given to us who take him as, his, as our savior as a gift. What a contrast, 
isn't it? It's amazing. The second event was his burial in the Garden of Gethsemane. For most of you, I'm sure this is review. But to me, this is foundational information that if we don't grasp it, we're missing on the heart of the gospel. The second was his burial in the Garden of Gethsemane where he lay for three days and nights and then was brought back to life by God, his Father. This is an event that had never happened. It was one of a kind. It signified the greatest victory the world has ever known. The greatest victory the world has ever known. God affirmed Jesus' sacrifice for sinners by what? By raising him from the dead, never to die again. Again, never heard of in history. The sinless, perfect Son of God paid for our sins by being a perfect sacrifice. That's critical information. No other sacrifice would have worked, but Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. The third event took place 40 days after his resurrection and is depicted in the Gospels with Jesus standing on a hill. God took him in the clouds to his dwelling place in heaven to sit on his right hand, which is a place of acceptance and honor and power. No one had ever sat there. Jesus is the only one who was worthy. Jesus told his disciples that he would come in the same manner in the clouds and he would take them and all of his followers to be with him forever. Yeah, forever. I haven't figured that one out yet because everything I know has a birth and a death and only lives a certain amount of time. But Jesus said, no, forever. Forever means no end. Bill addressed this when he spoke from Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. All these events were witnessed in Jerusalem by many. Both Bible writers and secular historians support their veracity. There is no real argument from history that these things didn't happen. Oh, you have many dissenters and many false arguments, but historically, these events are well-founded in history. Better, basically, than any other historical event. Better than the works of Shakespeare. The work of God is sure, and it is eternal. Um, during the 40 days between the resurrection and his ascension, he was seen by hundreds of people. And many gazed into that sky when Jesus went up in the clouds to see him ascend to heaven. Now, people can have visions and dreams, and some of them are real. But you don't have hundreds of people seeing something and being able to get away with the lie. It just really doesn't happen when you have that much observation. So these three events, as well as the birth of Jesus, are the most well-documented events in history. Do we believe them to be true? As a believer in the Bible, we don't have another option. Either you take the Bible as God's word or you treat it as something else. Many treat it as something else. But we affirm here in our little church, the Bible is God's word. It's the guide for life and practice. This is the gospel. It is the good news for the world. Jesus told those disciples to do what? To go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's been going on for almost 2,000 years. Millions and millions have accepted this gift from God. Millions and millions have already gone to heaven by death in these past 2,000 years. In other words, there is a multitude of people that have preceded us into heaven. And they're waiting for the return of Christ. When he will come and he will take the rest of his church to be with him. For some of us, it'll be by death. And we hope for some of us, it's by him coming in the clouds to take us to be to heaven. But we don't know the day or the hour of that time. We know that it could happen at any time. That's been taught since the Gospels. This decision is the number one decision 
that any person can make in the world. And I trust it's a decision you have made. I give this just as an introduction to the content of what God has laid on my heart for this Sunday and next Sunday. I love to read, and I read a lot of uh, Christian history, biographies, especially biographies of the great men and women of the Bible who have lived since the book of Acts was written. Pastor Bill is taking us through the book of Acts of the Apostles, but that only covers the first 50 or so years of the time from when Jesus was on the earth until the last disciple died, or it covers the era of what we call the Apostolic Church, which is what's outlined in the book of Acts. It began at the day of Pentecost, which is celebrated today, in case you didn't know that. This is the anniversary of the day of Pentecost when the church was established. It's described in Acts 1 and chapter 2. And it was spoken about by Bill last Sunday. From the gathering of maybe a hundred or so people, followers of Christ, his church has spread to every corner of the world, starting in Jerusalem. For 2,000 years, God has shown his power through miracles, healings, dreams, visions, and even personal appearances to people who seek him. The power of salvation is seen in millions of changed lives as converts leave wickedness and live changed lives for Jesus. Millions of believers have suffered death at the hands of those who oppose and hate Jesus or simply ignore him. Is what the Bible teaches a lie? I'm convinced it's the truth. Eternal life is the greatest gift one can receive. And in an all truth is based on God's word, the Bible. Where do you stand on the word of God? Is the word of God the Bible? Is the word of God something that's worth our time and our energy to absorb every day? Is the word of God worth sharing with other people? Do we triumph on the word of God? I remember as a little boy in Sunday school saying the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Now the kids sing songs like Jumping for Jesus, which I guess is okay. But I'll never forget that simple course, the B-I-B-L-E. Most Bible scholars who track the history of the New Testament believe the Apostle John was the final writer and that was the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Probably completed right around 90 AD, which was about 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus. John was the only apostle other than Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus, who was a martyr. John died a natural death, but John did not have an easy life. Neither did any of the other apostles. They all paid the ultimate price for following Jesus. Revelation completed God's story, which we call the Bible. This is God's word. All 66 books. Its writers were moved by the Holy Spirit to record God's story from Genesis to Revelation. And as stated by Paul to Timothy in his second letter, chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed. Most versions will say inspired, but it doesn't give the real meaning of those words came from God's mouth. All scripture is God-breathed. And those original documents were without error. Now, when you consider all the copying that has gone on with those many manuscripts, there are small technical errors, but no true Bible scholar who's put the Bible to the test has found any significant errors all through Scripture. Now, if you take something with 66 books, that is absolutely amazing. That only happens because of God's superintendency over his word. He says in Matthew, not one jot or tittle, the smallest marks in the Hebrew language, will pass away until when? My word is fulfilled. 
God will fulfill his word. Let's not be on the wrong side of history by neglecting God. Even though God's written word is completed, his Holy Spirit has been active since Pentecost in every believer as we become living epistles. Now this next section from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, says the following. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. He's referring to you and me. We read the epistles of Paul. Other people read what epistles? You and me. We are living epistles. Boy, that's an honor and a great privilege and a great responsibility. What kind of epistles are we? The life and testimony of every Christ follower should line up with the Bible. This is how we are living epistles. We are read, quote unquote, by those around us. And our godly lives should be a witness to the living Christ and the truth of his word. Do we not want to witness to be a light to others? One of the great criticisms of the church and people is you're all a bunch of hypocrites. Well, there are times when we are. We are very imperfect, even with the Holy Spirit. We fail frequently. But who is the real test of truth? It's Jesus. And when people come to you and want to be critical because the church is full of hypocrites, just remind them that if they are judged by God, they won't be judged because of the life of Andy Poole. They'll be judged by Jesus, who is the perfect judge. And his judgments are always correct. Psalm says, the Lord is just and righteous in all his ways. Boy, I'm glad he's the judge because he has all the information. I don't. That's why I'm not called to judge you. He even says we have a hard time judging ourselves. I want to give you some of the history and this is where my sermon is somewhat different. But I want to give you some of the history between the completion of the New Testament around 90 AD to today's day. That's 2,000 years. Can't do that in two weeks. Only the Bible is God's word. Only the Bible is God's word. Anything written since that time is not the Bible. Others claim that there are other books that belong to the Bible. There are apocryphal books. There are fictional books. There are some that you read, and I've tried them, and you laugh at how hilarious they are compared to the Bible. And over the years, many have claimed to have revelations, whether it's golden glasses or special plates or finding a lost book, whatever, whatever. But false religions have been built on these ideas and these found books. The only test of truth is compatibility with God's word. Do we believe God's word? God will do, I mean God, Satan will do everything he can to create doubt about God's word. Where did that first happen? Where? In the Garden of Eden, Satan told Eve, did God say? He planted doubt in Eve's heart. Adam was deceived but that where Satan used lies and deceit. His tactics have not changed since then. There is so much garbage in the world that claims to be godly that it's horrible. Don't base your life on that. Base it on the word of God. There are six men that I would like to talk about today and next Sunday throughout history that go from Augustine in the year 350, all the way to a man named David Brainerd, who lived in the 1700s. The first 300 years of the church, frankly, were a turmoil. There was a tremendous amount of persecution. Rome was in charge. Rome did everything it could to persecute Christians. 
they were mean and cruel. They crucified Christ, which was the worst form of putting someone to death. But there were many, many martyrs up until the time of Constantine. And if you know anything of the Roman history, you know that when Constantine became the emperor, he decided to make Christian, Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now that was good and that was bad. Because whenever the state proposes a religion, what happens? It goes to the lowest common denominator, in my opinion. And Christianity in the time of Constantine lost much of the vigor of the early apostolic church. And that's when the Church of Rome, we call the Roman Catholic Church, began on the ascendance to become the dominant church for the next 1,000 years. So Augustine in the mid-300s to David Brainerd in 1700. And the people I want to address include Martin Luther, who you probably have heard of, John Calvin, John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, and probably one you haven't heard of very much, a man named William Cooper. Their brilliance was in their devotion to God, not in their intellect, which they had. They all had feet of clay. If you hit clay with a rock, what happens to it? It crumbles, doesn't it? We all have feet of clay. And they all experienced failures. Those are the commonalities of godly men and women. They experience failure. We're weak. We have feet of clay. But we have a mighty God who overcomes that in so many ways. Some were so controversial, they were hounded to the point of death. Can't count how many times they tried to kill Martin Luther because of what he taught. Some lived a long life. And some lived a very short life, like David Brainerd, who died before he was 30. How many of you have heard of David Brainerd? Yeah, just a few. He was a missionary to the Indians back in the East Coast. A short life. You can get his diaries, his journals. I find them tough to read because he was melancholic. And he had a lot of depression. But he served the American Indians for four or five years. And he became the model for modern Christian missions. Try leave a mark in just four years. David Brainerd did that. But we'll talk more about him later on. Most wrote treatises or books or documents. Some, like Martin Luther, wrote 95 theses or statements. And he nailed them to the door of the church at Wittenberg, although some people dispute that. Some were poets, and their poetry was put to music. And we sing those hymns today. The greatest is probably our mighty fortress is our God. Who wrote that? Martin Luther. Probably more sung than any hymn in the world, except John Newton's Amazing Grace. So hymns have become very important in the life of the church because they portray the truth of Scripture. They mark out God's story or God's history. And then there's a long passage I'd like to have. Um, James has it on the screen, but I'm going to read it. It's from 1 Corinthians 1, 19 through 31. This encompasses people. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligence. I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Like the Greeks. Where is the teacher of the law? Like the Mosaics. Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made the foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Now the exhortation to us. Brothers and sisters, 
Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. God chose to save us by grace so there would be no boasting. If you had to buy a ticket to heaven with money, what would you boast about? I had enough money to get a ticket. The ticket is what counts. What if you had to be a noble person to get to heaven? I don't think there's anybody here who's a king or a queen or a princess. We just lost out. What if you had to do 10 good works a day and only one bad one? Well, we wouldn't qualify, so we lost out. So the only way of salvation is by G-R-A-C-E, an acronym, God's Riches at Christ's Expense. That's why we have salvation. And I love this passage because it defines very well why God chose the people he chose for salvation, those who believe on him. When you read Hebrew 11, Hebrews 11, you read a short chronicle of biblical heroes of faith from Abel to Samuel and the rest of the prophets. From verse 32 to 38, there is a list of their heroic deeds in God's eyes, not in man's eyes. And in verses 39 and 40, he closes chapter 11 with the following words. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So all of those saints who are in heaven before the, the crucifixion of Christ. They never saw the end result of that crucifixion. We look back, they look forward. You can read about the heroes of the Bible as you read your Bible. Now I'd like to turn to those six heroes that have existed since the year 300. And there's many, many more. I just had to pick six. And the one who helped me with those six is a man named John Piper. In fact, John Piper was a pastor of the church that um, the Musgraves went to back in Minnesota. And he's a great writer, in my opinion, and he wrote books. And he chose six men to highlight as to why they were heroes in God's eyes. And I've read those two books at least two or three times. And he wrote the books so that we would have, those that write, write, read them, a better idea of the purpose God has in using flawed people. That really caught my attention. God uses flawed people to show his glory. The flawed part shows God's glory. Whether it was Abraham, King David, Pharaoh, or a David Brainerd, these quote-unquote incomplete species of godliness and wisdom have kindled the worship of sovereign grace in the hearts of reminiscing saints. Quote from scripture, this will be written for a generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. One of the benefits of reading Christian history and reading of the last 1900 years is we become acquainted with people who were not included in Hebrews chapter 11. And there are hundreds and thousands of men and women who have become great examples for us because if they're a good example, we hope to follow them. And one of the points of Piper is all six of these people, when they found Christ, they found the absolute joy 
that there is in knowing God. And that's God's goal for us, to have absolute joy. Not that our joy is in a sports car or money or even a spouse or children. The best joy is in God because the other joys will flow from that. Now, let's start with the first one, and his name is Augustine. Augustine wrote a book called The Confessions of St. Augustine. Anybody ever read The Confessions of St. Augustine? And probably most haven't because they think it's Catholic. Now, Augustine lived at a point when the Catholic Church was strong. And he had a battle on his hand, and we're going to talk a bit about that. He was born in Africa, in Algeria, in 354. His father was a middle-income farmer, but his father was not a believer. He worked hard to get the best education in rhetoric, which is public speaking, for his son. In fact, he wanted him to be a lawyer. His father became a believer in the year 370, when Augustine was 16, which was one year before he died. That is his father. His Christian mother was named Monica. And as Augustine left to study in Carthage for three years, she implored him, quote, don't commit fornication nor seduce any man's wife. She must have known her son had propensities towards the flesh. He found Carthage, in his own words, to be a hissing cauldron of lust. Later, he wrote that my real need was for you, God, but I was willing to steal, and steal I did, although I was not compelled by any lack. He was at the top of his class. He was an outstanding scholar. He took a concubine for 15 years, no marriage. He had a son. He followed a path into education from age 19 to 30. God used various writings from the classics to move him closer to an understanding that only God could give him true joy. From the classics, no less. So he left his concubine after 15 years, sent her back to Africa, but then he found another lust-filled life with another concubine. While involved with another woman, this intense struggle led him to a quiet time alone in a garden. While in tears, he heard a child's voice saying, take it and read it, take it and read it. He sensed that came from God, and he decided to read the first scriptures he could find. He was staying with a friend named Olympus. He ran into the house. He grabbed a Bible. He let it open, and it opened to Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. And there's a quote. Not in reveling, nor drunkenness, not in lust and wantonness. That described Augustine's life up until his age of 31. Not in quarrels or rivalries. Rather, arm yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend no more thought on nature and nature's appetites. At this point, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into Augustine's heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. He accepted God's grace and salvation as a complete work of God. He was converted in this situation. Now, you're still a young man. He embarked on a battle with a British monk named Pelagius, who lived in Rome. And he taught, quote, though grace may facilitate the achieving of righteousness, it is not necessary to that end. Pelagius denied the doctrine of original sin, that we were born in sin and iniquity, and he asserted that human nature is good and is able to do all that it is commanded to do. Have you found that to be true? Really? You didn't find that to be true? Did anybody find it to be true? If you're honest, you didn't. This was the main teaching of Pelagius in the Roman church. And it goes straight against scripture. Let me get to my place. Um, <clears throat> for example, he says, this is Pelagius, if God is able to do all that is commanded to do, 
For example, if God tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves, which he does, Pelagius taught that the goodness of the human nature allows us to do that. You found that to be true? No. Any of you have neighbors you may not like all the time? But this is what he taught, Pelagius. So he denies the truth that we are saved solely by grace. It is not our work. It is the work of God as described in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. So a battle was hatched between Pelagius and Augustine. And over the next 40 years, Augustine started a monastery. He basically separated himself from the Roman Catholic view, although still claimed by Roman Catholics. And his monastery was set up in Hippo, Africa. And he set the course of biblical truth for the next 1,000 years. That's the impact that Augustine had on the church. Now, many of us know that from 300 for the next 1,000 years, there was a lot of darkness in the world. There are many books that have been written on history at that time, and some call it the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. I never got into much of that stuff. I found it too discouraging. And I don't really like to read discouraging stuff very much. But that was the course of history. And Augustine set that mark. He was an Augustinian monk. And that went for a thousand years. Until what time? The Reformation in Germany. And that was the next critical point in the history of the church. Now, there were many, many solid believers during that thousand period time. Many of them were Roman Catholics, but in many ways they disagreed with the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. One of them was a man named Bernard of Clairvaux, and he wrote some beautiful hymns that we sing today that are very biblically based. Well, we come up to a thousand years later, and Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. He was in the train of Augustinians for a thousand years. And if you know anything about Martin Luther's conversion, which we'll deal with next Sunday, he came across the phrase in Romans, the just shall live by faith, not by works, not faith plus works. And he left the Roman Catholic Church. He posted his 95 theses on the wall. And if you have any sense of history, you know that that changed the history of the world when the Reformation came in the time of Luther. I encourage you to read Hebrews 11 this week to search some of the names mentioned in that hall of faith to find out why are these men and women in the hall of faith and expect God to speak to you through his word. Go into that time with a sense of expectancy that God will speak to you through these examples that you and I can both learn how to seek him fully, to know his grace, his mercy, and his love. My prayer is that the godly examples will motivate us to settle on nothing but the best that God has for us. Next week I will do part two and discuss five of those other personalities and we'll be referring to the word of God because that is the basis but I think it's a a needy time in our history to know what God is doing in the world today. Uh, If you read of countries in the Near East, the Far East, all across Africa, India, China, just finished a book on Tibet that Bryce referred us to at that missions weekend. I, I think it's hard to fathom what most Christians are facing in countries that deny the gospel and espouse things like humanism, Buddhism, Mormonism, uh, Islam, and many of the other false beliefs that permeate our world. God calls us to know the truth and to follow him. Would you stand as we close in prayer? Father, I thank you that your word is truth. 
that it's, you said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in this room who has not taken that step of asking Jesus to be their Savior, confessing their sin, how I pray they would not leave this building apart from that. We thank you for who you are. We love you and pray that we would see you work in our lives every day. In Jesus' name, amen. highest of heights to the depths of the sea creations revealing your majesty from the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring every creature unique in the song that it sings all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable. All struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. told every lightning bolt where it should go or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow who imagined the sun and give source to its light yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Oh, powerful, untamable, awestruck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. of my heart and you love me the same you are amazing God bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We are dismissed. Mm -hmm.